The neat thing about these meetings is that we always end up all saying the same thing. She singing largely from the same sheet of music. Uh, there's a reason for that. We've been through the wars and we had to live with what was going on politically. And, 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 and to think that we can isolate this conversation from, from the politics of it is just insane. Can't be done. So let me draw back and just recall, uh, I'm the oldest guy here. I'm, I've been around longer than anybody else. So I got more scars, I guess. But in the, in the early 80s, we were trying to craft something to replace the GATT to bring trade and services and investment and intellectual property to the fore because we could see that's where our employment process was taking the United States. And it was a pretty exciting time. We had a lot of bumps in the road. We were, we were pretty negative with some of our policies. Our, our friends and allies were also negative. But we ended up coming out of that period with a world trade organization. It was a place where we could resolve these disputes and then we began to really hum. I mean, things were humming. We, we, we had terrific growth over the last 20 years for, for the world. We've taken a billion and a half people out of poverty, a billion and a half people out of poverty through the process of world trade in the last 30, 20 or 30 years. 20 years, I guess, is more precise. What we haven't done, and Mickey touched on, well, virtually all of us have said it one way or another. We haven't understood what's happening to the body politic here and in other countries around the world. Uh, we haven't paid attention to the, the sense of vulnerability and the increase in that sense of vulnerability that exists out there. And it's real. It's real because the world is changing very, very fast. And it's hard for us to adapt at that, to that speed of change. So we're vulnerable, and it makes us nervous, and when we feel vulnerable, we come to our government and we ask for relief. And government will always respond to that request because it's, it's easy to do so if, we, if we've got somebody to blame that can't vote in our district. And that's what, that's what trade protectionism is. And that's where we are today. We have not really thought about the fundamental changes. Here's the problem. When I was at Labor, we published a Workforce 2000. We said the average worker is going to have, I think, six to, to eight jobs in their working life, uh, two to three different careers. That was before the Internet. We also said that the people who were at risk were the, were the low-skilled workers of America. That was before the Internet. What did the Internet do? When we digitized work, we made it possible for any routine job to be automated. Any routine job, whether it's in manufacturing or the service sector, whether it's in skilled or unskilled. So all of a sudden, instead of a low wage uh, community in the United States being at risk, most of us were at risk. People have sensed that. We've also sensed that because a job can be placed anywhere and done by anybody without moving the body, we can outsource our work. We can have call centers in 20 countries. <coughs> That's not a, a manual job in a plant. It used to be a service job that was pretty good. We can outsource architectural work, engineering work, electrical uh, engineering. We can outsource most things today. What we have not done is to say, what does that imply for us in terms of domestic policy? Now, last week it was, Sherm, that you had Max Baucus here. Max Baucus stood before this group and said something pretty, pretty important. He said, and I think I'm quoting fairly precisely, and until an expanded and reauthorized trade adjustment assistance is passed, other issues on the trade agenda, like the free trade agreements with Colombia, South Korea, and Panama, must take a back seat. I understand that. I really do. I, I know the politics of the game. But, but these are really important agreements. 
they have huge consequence for workers and jobs in the United States. So my response is, let's make a deal. <laughs> let's go back to the table politically and acknowledge the vulnerability, acknowledge the jeopardy, acknowledge the hazard that we face and say, okay, we probably do have to improve trade adjustment assistance in the short term if we're going to make that part of the deal. But if we stop there, we're making a huge mistake. But Carl, Carla was saying earlier in the first presentation that if the Doha round doesn't make it this year, uh, and if, we, if the Doha round fails, it's going to be a long time before we have the political climate to do another round. I'm going to tell you, it'll, it'll not happen in our lifetime if something doesn't change because it isn't just the United States where that vulnerability is increasing, it's around the world. So here's what we've got to think about. If you're unemployed, it doesn't really matter why you're unemployed. You're out of work. Your family's at risk, and you want to do something about it, and you want some help. Okay. Max Baucus is right. Short term, let's cut a deal. Let's give trade adjustment assistance. Let's improve it. Can be. Uh, there are a number of areas in which it can be improved, and he suggested a number of those. But then let's go back and say, why do we call it trade adjustment assistance? Unemployment has very little to do with trade. It has a lot to do with the fact that this is a radically different economic world. It's not just trade, it's outsourcing, it's automation, it's the whole nine yards for every, I don't know what Rob, Rob said, two to three percent was caused by trade. I would argue it's more than that, but, but the, the point is that at least nine out of ten people who lose their jobs are losing it because of the changing nature of the work domestically, not the changing nature of the global trade environment. So we need to have a policy that, that recognizes uh, that our only renew renewable resource in this country is our human resource. That means we've got to address the unbelievably inadequate public education system we've got in the United States start with that. We got to also admit that the people who are going to be working 20 years from now are largely already working in the workforce today. What are we doing about them? Calling trade adjustment assistance as a response to the problem makes people think that trade is the problem. It's really dangerous to have trade adjustment assistance. Let's talk about the fact that people are out of work and we as a country ought to be providing them with tools to become reemployed as fast as they can in the best possible way that we can. We need to recraft our entire employment and reemployment system, our entire training system. If you look at the facts, 67% uh, of people who get TAA are, are reemployed within a year. How about the other third? 80% of the people who are getting the other form of reemployment support from a work, a work uh, investment act, uh, kind of stuff, 80% of those are getting jobs. Maybe that's a better program. Why don't we think about doing that? Why don't we start creating some new ideas like let's create a tax-free account for every living American. You could put money into it any time you wanted to. Have your family put money into it any time you wanted to. Any company put money into it as a lifetime education and training improvement account and let you draw from it without tax at any point when you need to do that. We need to start focusing on the human aspect, the human development aspect of our economic circumstance. If we don't get more competitive with our human talent in this country, nothing else is going to change. The best agreements in the world are not going to save us from tough competition. When we've gone from first to 28th, first to 28th in the last 20 years in terms of our kids' ability to do math in the eighth grade. Other countries, we, maybe we're not doing less, they're just doing more. We better get off our you-know-what and go to work and, and start taking this devil on. We have simply got to rethink the human development of this country. So. To summarize uh, what Sharon asked me to talk about, 
TAA is an essential part of a bargain, a grand bargain this year. We need to have that bargain on the table. We need to get these agreements done. We need to get TAA as part of that commitment. And then we better start talking about a really new commitment to the human development of the people of this country and a whole new way of thinking about how we deal with the unemployed, how we improve their health opportunity, their training opportunity, their education opportunity, so that they can be productive. That's what they want, and it's what's right for all of us. Thank you.